Decades pass. One walks through a darkened room in which someone has died, and suddenly one recalls long forgotten words and the roar of the sea. It's as if those few words had captured the whole meaning of life. But afterwards, one always talks about something else. Welcome to Classics Considered. I'm Marion, and this is episode 14 Embers, a Hungarian classic. It's not often that one comes across a book that you've never heard of before, but turns out to be very surprising, surprising in a good way. And this book, Embers by Shandor Mari, comes under that category of books that I just stumbled across on the internet and decided to give a try. This is a historical fiction novel from 1942, and Mari is considered to be one of the greatest Hungarian authors, so I do think this falls under the realm of classics, even though it is so little known in the English-speaking world. This book was translated by Carol Brown Janeway. I have no prior knowledge of this translator either, but I thought it was a great translation. And uh, the Hungarian title for this book is actually The Candles Burn Down to the Stump. But in English, the title is simply Embers. And again, the author's name is Shandor Mari. I, that's a very rough pronunciation. Uh, but that's what it sounded like to me as I listened to some pronunciations online. Three things to know about Shandor Mari. He was born in 1900 in the Kingdom of Hungary, which was at that time part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was a semi-contemporary with Franz Kafka. Their lives overlapped, although they weren't true contemporaries in terms of when they were uh, famous writers. Uh, Franz Kafka was also born in Austro-Hungary uh, in what is now known as the Czech Republic. The second thing you should know about Mari is that he took a strong stance against both fascism and communism, two of the very strong ideologies that came up in the 20th century. So Mari became a real hero to the Hungarians because he took this uh, stance against those uh, extremist ideologies in his writing and his poetry. Uh, he had to flee Hungary in the late 40s because the communist government was cracking down on him, and eventually he immigrated to the United States. Mari continued to write in the United States, but he did suffer from some traumatic uh, personal events and depression, and he took his life in February 1989, which was just eight months before the communist rule in Hungary ended. In the following decade, in the 90s, his works were finally translated to English for the first time. Uh, so those are the three highlights of what you need to know about Mari, and uh, this book Embers is one of those books that was translated after his death. Embers was a contemporary novel of the day. It was published in 1942, and the frame story takes place in Hungary of 1942. It centers around this old general named Henrik, who is in his mid-70s, and he is a hermit who lives in a castle on a beautiful estate in Hungary. Uh, general Henrik is reminiscing about his life and particularly about a very life-changing event which took place about 43 years ago, and it started with this hunt in the forest. And as he's remembering this, and as he's walking through his castle, he's also waiting for a visitor who is his childhood friend, Conrad. And he hasn't seen Conrad since uh, that event 43 years ago. Conrad, it appears, has wronged him, and the general is plotting his revenge. So that's the frame story here. The overarching plot is, again, about the general's life, which he's looking back over, and about the friendship that develops between these two boys who meet at Military Academy uh, when they're very young. And they form a very deep friendship that isn't necessarily romantic, but the general realizes that it's a very, very strong bond, which has had um, very important implications over the rest of his life. 
uh, Henrik, the general, he grew up to be a true soldier, and he's a privileged person. He grew up with wealth and position and all those things that gave him that advantage as a young man. While his friend Conrad, although he had also uh, been studying to be a soldier, he was always a musician and a poet at heart. He's said to be related to Chopin, the pianist composer, and Conrad's parents are poor. They've had to uh, basically give up everything just so Conrad can put on the appearance of a gentleman. And Conrad knows this very deeply and feels it very deeply. He has little to his name and he's not admired in society like Henrik. In fact, a lot of doors are closed to him. And then in the middle of this developing friendship, both Henrik and Conrad fall in love with the same woman, Christina, who is a charismatic and very passionate woman. So um, that's the story. And I will get into that a little bit more in a moment. But I wanted to talk about right off the bat the writing. So when I start reading a new author, of course, one of the very first things I pay attention to is the writing style. Um, because most of the great authors of classic literature have something distinctive about their writing, something that makes you remember them and you come to expect it in their novels or their poetry. In Mari's case, his style is very much of the era. It's very concise, which you expect in 20th century literature, but it's also very exquisite. It's almost Conradian, and by Conradian I mean Joseph Conrad, the Polish author. It's it's almost um, a monologue at times because most of the book is in fact Henrik talking to Conrad. And there's also little moments of irony which also reminded me of Conrad. So I was really impressed with how well that was crafted. And then what also helps that is his use of subtlety and just small details and nuances which make the story unfold in a very gradual and yet effective way. One technique which Shandur Mari uses is he builds up the descriptions and the sense of time and place in addition to the character development. It's almost operatic the way everything is gradually revealed. You know, in an opera you've got the overture and then you might have a chorus and then you'll start to see each character singing their piece, their aria. And I felt the same sense of that in Mari's book. And that's fitting because, again, one of the characters is a musician at heart. It's also kind of cinematic. I think this would make a great film. And just to give you a sense of what his writing does, a lot of the book, a lot of the beginning of the book is a description of the castle. And his first description of part of the castle is simply pointing out that there are rooms that are blue and red and green. And this is all pointed out in kind of a simplistic way from the viewpoint of a man who is used to everything he sees. This is his house. So the general's going through his house and, you know, he recognizes everything. But then later what Mari does is he goes back and he describes those rooms again. And he says, quote, The castle interiors were all in pastels. The walls hung with coverings of pale blue, pale green, and soft rose striped with gold from workshops near Paris. So just with those two different descriptions of the same thing, he's given you a sense of both the place and the characters, and it's just really a neat touch with very few words. I've mentioned before how much I dislike exposition in a story. I'm not a huge fan of sweeping descriptions or even conversations where everything is um, spelled out by one character to another. It's very common in movies and in some books, especially historical fiction, where the author is attempting to educate the reader without necessarily um, speaking to them directly. But I'm not a huge fan of that myself in prose but here in Embers, I find that it works very well because the general is reminiscing about his life and talking to it, uh, to Conrad about it. So here he does a good job with that. And then also I felt like the scale of the writing was a good fit, a good balance between personal drama and also history, 
social commentary and philosophy. And it reminded me a lot of Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, because what Dostoevsky did in Karamazov was he tried to describe to you the mentality and culture and setting of Russia through the lives of the Karamazov brothers. And then I feel like uh, Mari is doing a similar thing here with the general and his friend Conrad and Christina, except I feel like it fits a little bit better here. The ratio or balance between the personal family drama and the uh, cultural drama, you might say, historical drama, uh, goes together better in Embers. I feel like the personal drama doesn't get drowned out by the overarching uh, bigger themes. Whereas in The Brothers Karamazov, at times I felt like those bigger themes were kind of swallowing the story and then you also had that abrupt ending. But here it wasn't uh, as like that and actually ending in Embers is quite a good ending. It gives you that closure that you want. So I was really impressed by that. I mentioned a moment ago that this book does have those bigger themes of history and uh, so society, philosophy, and culture. So what you get in Embers is sort of a visual representation and kind of a, a sort of a painting, but also a verbal discourse of the evolution of Hungarian society starting with the glittering Austro-Hungarian Empire in all of its glory up through the decay of the interwar period after the empire had collapsed at the end of World War I. There's a lot of social commentary in this book. The friendship between Henrik and Conrad is a great example because, as it is emphasized, it's a non-romantic uh, bond, but it's as binding, at least to Henrik, as a romantic relationship. And of course, there's the whole uh, discussion of class distinction and poverty, as illustrated in the life of Conrad. There's a talk about colonialism and the different styles of colonialism that the European powers demonstrate in other countries around the world. He talks about the difference between military under a monarchy versus under a series of republics which Hungary was ruled by after the end of the monarchy. Uh, some of the republics were communist and some were anti-communist, but at least from Henrik's point of view, it was just not the same to be a military person under that new structure of government. And of course, there's those psychological changes which came about through World War I, sort of these ideals of duty being replaced by cynicism for some people. The general is of that old school, and from his perspective, he still holds on to the things that were before the war. He says, quote, For me, that world is still alive, even if in reality it no longer exists. It lives because I swore an oath to uphold it. So it's kind of also, I would say almost surrealist the way the general is He's kind of trapped in the past, and you might call it trapped, or you might call it uh, committed to, but either way, he is of a different world, and one of the things that he has left out of his life is technology. He makes reference to telephones and radios, but he says with no little pride that they are largely absent from his, his world. So yeah, that's a lot of topics to be covering in one fairly short novel, and I was extremely impressed by that. Perhaps the biggest theme that I got from this book was that um, events are very personal things, whether they're you know personal events or historical events or changes in society, and our experiences are going to be the difference between something really affecting us deeply or maybe not as deeply as it affects other people. The most life-shattering event in this general's life as he's remembering it is not World War I, but it's actually a very uh, personal life-shattering event which Conrad is a part of. Uh, another thing that he talks about is the concept of otherness and living in a sort of binary or bipolar world where everything is divided in two parts with one side 
against another. He goes into a lot of existential questions like, what is friendship? What is love? And uh, for the general, he very much associates duty with each of these emotions. And he tends to view them in that, you might say, old school manner that you make a commitment to somebody or you make a commitment in some relationship. You stick to it because it's your duty. And that's how he relates to his country. And that's how he relates to other people. And uh, he definitely comes to some various conclusions regarding all these questions. And honestly, I didn't really agree with all his conclusions. I think this is where the book went very much into the realm of romance with a little r. It definitely, I feel, substituted some fantasy for realism. And again, I just didn't particularly like some of the conclusions the general came to in the end. But that said... This was a very beautiful and touching book. Mari took a concept, you know, the classic love triangle concept, which is not terribly original in and of itself, but he approached it in a way that felt unique and where you were getting so much more than that core story at the heart of the entire novel. And again, I was just very touched by the story and I was very impressed by the writing. I read this using my library's OverDrive account, and I would seriously consider purchasing this. I would probably read it again, not necessarily for that personal drama, but all the other things that surrounded the story and which played into the psychological character study of the General and Conrad and Christina. So, this is one of the most interesting books I've read recently, and I do recommend it to anyone looking for a really interesting historical fiction novel, and which is written by a author of Hungarian classics. Apparently, Mari wrote many books, something like 30 plus um, various works, and not all of them are translated into English, but I would certainly look out for more in the future. Theme song is inspired by Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com. Licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. See creativecommons.org slash licenses slash by slash 3.0.